All right, Wes. We haven't talked any Marvel for a while. I know both of us big Marvel fans. You know, there's not been a ton of Marvel news of late, or at least uh, new things dropping anyway. But one thing I want to talk about is the the grand scale of this phase of Marvel. Uh, you know, we had the the first several phases created the Infinity Saga, and we're now currently in the beginnings of the multiversal saga. And I'm pretty sure that's what it'll just continue to be called until it's done. With the first one, with the Infinity Saga, we had Thanos as the overarching bad guy. And it's clear to me at this point that when it's all said and done, the multiversal saga will be controlled predominantly by Kang. Well, I want to start out by pointing out the fact when we first meet Kang, that he's eating an apple. Because eating an apple in conversation is universally seen as you're an asshole. Yeah. You know, whether you're evil or not, I guess might be in speculation, but you're definitely a dick if you're on camera eating an apple in a conversation. The main thing I want to discuss when it comes to Kang in the MCU, and uh, primarily the first time that we see him on camera, I had a question when I first watched, which was why Loki to begin with? I mean... I know that's an easy question because it's Loki's show, but you could have started Kang anywhere. So I had to really think of what would be the reason why Kang show, or chose Loki as his predecessor for his endeavor controlling the TVA and ultimately time in the MCU at large. I have a thought on that, and that would just be that if you think about Loki at his core, He's the, probably the most self-serving character there ever was in the MCU. And he likes to control the situation at all times. You know, he, he yes, he's the jokester and the trickster, but even all those tricks are him being in control. At his core, he would be the perfect choice because he likes to control things, and if you give him the job of controlling the entire timeline, well, I think he'd be pretty good at it because he would feel like he is beyond a god. Because we first meet Kang's variant at the end of Loki, played by Jonathan Majors, uh, so we just naturally go with, because he states that he's done this you know, hundreds of thousands of times, that he's always done this hundreds of thousands of times with Loki. My theory is while he might have done it a multitude of times with Loki to get the conversation right and to know how things were going to go, Loki was not his first choice. That is my major theory about Kang and his time-controlling endeavor. Who do you think his first choice is? Well, I think several people. But it would stand to reason that he would have tried a hero first. And the reason why he settled on Loki later is because he had to have realized that there aren't too many heroes that are going to do that. According to his tale, he was the winner. You know, he, he brought all these timelines together to control it. Right. So of all of these conquerous, evil terrible villain versions of himself, he still came out on top, apparently. Apparently. And I assume we will get to see that at some point. Maybe, maybe not. But the fact of the matter is, for someone to come out on top, that in that kind of world, and these types of characters we're talking about, he would have to be evil at his core. Because you're destroying countless amounts of lives to create one timeline from many. So if you had a million universes and timelines and you created them down to one, well, you're down one short of a million. So that many people have been annihilated by this, this man. But at what point that focus on control, when does it become something altruistic to where you are trying to keep a balance? Because if you're just evil and you're just been on chaos and you just want to win. Once you've won, that's pretty much it. But the Kang that we're introduced to at the end of Loki actually seems like he gives a shit to an extent. I think that character became complacent 
with the singular timeline that he created. And that is why, in essence, his timeline ran out because he was no longer needed. And you could even say at a, at a grander scale that it had to blow up. The, there was always meant to be many universes and timelines and there never should have been just one it goes against the laws of nature in this world in which we're discussing that there should always be uh, a never-ending supply of timelines well it's like a can of snakes right so you get all the snakes and you you tighten the springs and you pack them all into the can and they're contained in that can but because of the way that, you know, uh, potential and kinetic energy works, those springs are constantly trying to resist being contained yeah. and they're trying to get out. Now, I'm not saying that once the snakes are out, that everything's going to be good because usually that's the thing. The snakes come out, there's a big reaction, but then you have to get the snakes back in the can for the next time. Mm -hmm. So and it's a never ending cycle. Exactly. But the way it's, said at the end of Loki, it seems to me like Kang wants to end the cycle completely. It kind of does, but then again, you know, that whole scene, which personally I think is an amazing scene, takes up the majority of that whole episode. Uh, and Jonathan Majors is great in that scene. The dude talks in circles so much, you never can really tell what his true motivation is, you know? And, and he almost comes across like he's hell-bent on chaos. Well, again, he's complacent. He does talk in circles. And one of the biggest nagging questions I had watching it was, if your idea is to turn this over to Loki and Sylvie because you say that they need to work together to do this because this, this is a package deal, why, after you immediately get them coming around to your side, pit them against each other with subtle little points of conversation and you know he makes a few jabs about her not being able to trust and loki being mischievous and that kind of thing if that was your end game to let these guys take over for you once you presented it to them and they were down you wouldn't have kept talking but it's the fact that he keeps talking he actually fucks it up so did he intentionally plan on sylvie stabbing him was he trying to push them into killing him was that like so he's done, they're taking over, so he has nothing left. At that moment, I guess the only thing left for him was to die. He even states that, you know, if it goes this way, then I'll, I'll just end up back here in the long run anyway. If he truly is complacent and bored with this grand timeline that he's created, you know, he claims to have seen everything up until that point, and he knew it was going to be them. And so at that point, he, he's like, well, what do I have to do to finish this off? I have to provoke him. Well, that brings up an interesting question. Who's setting all of this up for him? Clearly, he just doesn't reset from the dawn of time and then continues to control everything until the end of it. I feel as though that's left pretty vague. Um, and, you know, something like that. You don't want to give everything away, obviously, in his, his first appearance. There's there's a lot still to be hashed out about the character. And like most Marvel stuff, you're not going to learn it all. Because a lot of it needs to be left up to speculation. Well, I think, you know, they're in the first time we saw Thanos as fanboys at the end of the credits when you see him. You fill in a lot of the gaps in the speculation yourself because you know who Thanos is. You know what to expect. And in large part, there were broad strokes that they carried out with Thanos, but they developed the character in a certain way on their own. Yes. There's a lot of aspects to that character's personality that I think were choices made by Josh Brolin. That being said, there are broad strokes to the character of Kang the Conqueror, but the way Jonathan Majors played that role, I don't think like met anyone's expectations. Well, and, and the big difference between what we're going to have between Josh Brolin as Thanos and Jonathan Majors is the fact that we're now in a multiversal story, so you don't have just the one character of Thanos. You have the many faces of Kang, which we've seen He Who Remains. You know, Ant-Man's coming up. We're, we know, already been announced, that Kang's going to be in that. So what do you think about that leaked footage of Ant-Man? You know, being leaked footage, it's not high quality, but 
Marvel's always going to be very sly about what they do and don't release in a trailer. And you never can truly trust any of it. So, I don't make a lot of judgments on Marvel trailers anymore. I am looking forward to more Kang. Uh, he Who Remains was badass, but left me wanting more because, man, that's a cool character. We get to have him for several years, but again, there's very little going on in that trailer to give me any idea of what's going to happen other than Kang being in it, which I already knew. I definitely want to see more Jonathan Majors as Kang. He who remains. Uh, I thought he killed that role even for like the nine, ten minutes we saw him. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people make early predictions about Quantum Mania, uh, primarily focused around Scott Lang's will be killed off by Kang the Conqueror. Do you have any stock in that? It could happen. They're only going to kill him off if they're done. Chris Evans, they didn't really kill him off, but you know, he was done. Robert Downey Jr. was done. And so they killed him off. You know, in a very epic way. You know, I don't know when Paul Rudd's contract runs out with him. And if he's done, then sure, they could kill him off. I think it would be big to do so to kill him off, especially in his own movie versus a Avengers level movie. And it could spark a lot of other things happening down the road as well. Well, you know, as far as killing off Scott Lang, I think it would only serve for shock value. Paul Rudd is a very popular actor, and the character he plays in the MCU, it doubly so. Um, for some reason, everybody likes Ant-Man. I like Ant-Man. I like um, Ant-Man. I have a, um, I wouldn't say necessarily an end game theory about Ant-Man, but more of a what we're going to see in Ant-Man. I think we'll learn that they have the ability to time travel through, you know, any time they want. And I think we might see like a brief, like, future past you know maybe some funny moments with paul rudd being back in time you know in the renaissance era something like that but i think we're going to focus on one or two major time periods he will end up in the future that's how we'll see kang do you think we'll see rama tut it's possible but that's where my major kang theory lies i don't think wasp or ant-man are gonna die I think Scott Lang is going to be thrown backwards in time, and that's how we will end Quantumania. And so he'll be left somewhere. He'll be stranded somewhere in time. And he'll leave a message or a sign for future Avengers to discover, and then they'll have to time travel again in a future movie to save Scott Lang, and that's when we'll meet Ramata. That's a good possibility, and that could be very interesting until down the road when they give us the Kang Dynasty. But it's also possible that every single appearance of this dude is a different version, and then they all come together for the Kang Dynasty. So both both of which... The Council are, of Kangs. Yeah. As far as... Uh, Quantumania, you know, I think about what they've done so far with the multiversal stories between the multiple multiple timelines in Loki and the multiverses in Doctor Strange and even the multiverses of Spider-Man No Way Home. And each time they've done it a little differently. And it's almost like, I think of like how in The Walking Dead, how each group of people has their own name for zombies walkers and biters and such right, right. I, I look at it kind of like that it's like okay so you know there's the timeline situation with the tva and everything in loki and then you've got you know dr strange is just straight up multiverses which are kind of what i anticipated from the way he who remains described them in that conversation with loki and sylvie but then you've got the, in Spider-Man, it's almost like it's very randomized and oh, to, unfortunately to be kind of cliche, it's like a spider web. Considering the fact that time manipulation as explained in Endgame alters the course of history, but it has to create its own pocket universe. Yep. The very MCU we could be watching might not be the main timeline we end up with when it's all said and done. 
That is very possible. I mean, we've all come to, you know, expect Tom Holland to be our Spider-Man. But when it, when everything's done, Andrew Garfield could be the Spider-Man in the MCU. Or somebody else entirely. Exactly. Hell, it could be Donald Glover, although I don't think that will be the case. You know, in Doctor Strange, you had America Chavez and her multiverse punch, or whatever you want to call it. It's just another way to access it. You know, Doctor Strange did it through spells. There's there's different ways to access these now that you could say that they weren't accessible prior to the events of the end of Loki. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But I'm led to believe, based on that story in our MCU timeline, that they were not accessible until Sylvie killed He Who Remains. And now everything is open to that, and we get to see all these different ways to manipulate and travel through them. So all the different ways we see to access or disrupt or rip a hole in the multiverse, I don't think it was caused by any one person. You know, uh, Spider-Man had a hand in it. Strange had a hand in it. Wanda had a hand in it. Sylvie and Loki, when they encounter the TVA and uh, Kang the Conqueror. I think all those pieces together made the multiverse unstable. Well, as far as making it unstable, I think as a whole, it's just unstable in general. But what I'm saying is, you know, he who remains had it down to the one sacred timeline. And that by by Sylvie killing him and, you know, you know, basically resulting in the end of a prophecy or whatever, if you will, it it broke up the timelines. I don't take that at face value. Okay, so Kang the Conqueror tells Loki and Sylvie that he has dwindled everything down to this one timeline. But if that was true, then all of the things that happen that fringe on the multiverse could not happen. Something as simple as Loki taking the Tesseract out of play created a deviant timeline. If the TVA has encountered all of these Lokis from all of these different uh, multiple universes, then it isn't trimmed down to one. That's the lie. The lie is that it's one. It's not just one. It was just his. He was protecting his timeline from other versions of himself. Well, you could go as far as to say, so we what we see in Loki up until the end of that is this particular he who remains his sacred timeline, okay? His. That doesn't make it the only one. I, it's not, I didn't say it was the only one. That's the only one we've ever seen. So by resulting in the end of that, that episode and he dies, let's say for the sake of argument that it's the same across all the multiverses. Every one of them has their he who remains of their own multiversal stack of cards, if you will. By allowing the timeline to branch like it does, it can now overlap with the other multiverses kept within their own sacred timeline. And so now, what you're saying is, no matter what path a timeline goes down, it will always end where all the other ones do with Theoretic. with he who remains at the end of time. Because I would interject that because it's a multiverse, then there has to be universes where he's not the dominant. Well, theoretically, that is the case. Uh, my basis of that argument, strictly for this, is the fact that if, a, if any other universe you know, was wild and could do what it wanted to as far as crossing over paths with other multiverses, then they would be crossing over the path with our universe that we know. And it's not because he who remains keeps it everything trimmed out. That would make sense for all of them to be that way. And maybe it's a different character, but there's always somebody who has to keep that timeline in check within each of the multiversal timelines. Thanos was convinced that the Infinity Stones were the ultimate power in the cosmos. 
Right. That with these six stones, you could accomplish anything you wanted to. Right. Loki makes the Infinity Stones irrelevant. Yep. So here's my problem with that. Time is one of the fucking stones. Yes. So if you have the six stones, all this mucking about with time travel and tech and TVA and pruning and all that bullshit could be negated with the Infinity Stones. So that but, tell, that tells me there's <clears throat> either Marvel did not think about how stupid that fucking sounds when you really think about it, or time is not the ultimate power and it's just the one that Kang uses to manipulate shit the way he wants it right now. Time is just one of many aspects. And see, that's the great thing about Marvel, you know? They cover this like it's the greatest thing, the grandest thing in the history of all of media. But it's just one step. I mean, time is literally just the tool that Kang uses to flex his will on the universe. But other villains use other things. Of course. So just because he's doing it this way doesn't mean that it's right. It's just his method of control. Exactly. On this day in movie history, we have a couple of birthdays we'd like to acknowledge. We'd just like to wish a happy birthday to the lovely Tessa Thompson, who plays Valkyrie in the MCU. Very, very great actress. Also, uh, Lena Headley who plays uh, Queen Cersei and Queen Gorgo in a very couple of big properties I'm a fan of, Game of Thrones and 300. We're not done talking about Kang. That's Wes. And he's Corey. And we're the, the Trifleman. Trifleman.